back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, definitely looking at these 90-degree days and thinking, man, it's baseball, it's beach. It's time to get down to the Outer Banks and live the salt life. I, my man Dennis Colazzo is catching these giant fish and stuff that I'm seeing on the internet. I'm getting all lubed up for my Maryland Crab Cake Tour. Maybe a little fly fishing in it for me and some crabbing. Uh, uh, the White Marlin Open is going to be going on during the Crab Cake Tour, so they're inviting me out. The good news is my neck, my back, my shoulders, everything is going to feel great. Because my friends at MOI have gotten me a new desk. Uh, Luke, I don't know if, if you can see this with the camera, but if it goes up, see, I disappear. You see how that happens? And if I pull it down like this, it comes back up. But here's the really cool part. Let me show you this. Ready? This is a really neat part. So as it goes up, if I start to go like this and I start to do this, I can actually stand. I've never done the show standing before. I'm going to try to stand. Big appreciation to Dave Knoll and everybody. Hold on. Can I make it all the way up? No, that's as high as it goes. Hold on. It doesn't go any higher. Hold on. What do really tall people do? Hi. So now I'm standing. What do you think? I'm like ESPN now. That's yeah. pretty good. That's pretty good. I, th I thought you were actually going to do the Austin Powers routine where you pretend like you're on the elevator going Beam down. Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up. <laughs> uh, Luke Jones is here. If you're watching out on our YouTube and our WNSTV channel, I can now stand thanks to our friends at MOI. So give Dave Knoll a shout. And everybody over there has just been great. Uh, I got a chair. I'm comfy. No disrespect to Dr. Steve at LA Chiropractic the Life, but, you know, my back's feeling a little better, so I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Luke, um, 90 degrees. Uh, the hockey game's not on anymore. There's a little Jimmy Buffett reference there for you. Um, but football, I, OTAs and where we are, and I guess of all the weird scuttlebutt and watching these guys on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the places that they go and post – that they, they pick on each other about basketball and this and that, but I've never seen anything quite like how important a single digit number is <laughs> to uh, NFL <laughs> players. I, you know, I, I was always, uh, I thought I liked Reggie Jackson when I was a kid. So, I, you know, if I could wear number nine when I played baseball um, or number 44, but actually number 36 was my favorite number, but I wore 44 because it was available because Rondell Hunt wore 36. And if you're friends with Rondell out on Facebook, let him know I'm still mad at him. I'm not over. It was 1981 Little League. Um, but everybody has a number, right? So I'm telling you about Rondell Hunt, my buddy stealing my number and I had to wear number 44 like Reggie Jackson. Because that's what he wore when he got to the Yankees. And then I met him and decided not so much on Reggie. Um, what was your favorite number? What number did you wear, Luke? 21 was my number. And it a started out my first. I got a yeah. Clemente hat. I'll give it to you. There you go. But it started out just as that was my, my first year because I played youth football. I started playing football third or fourth grade, I think it was. And I was assigned 21. I ended up being primarily a corner. I wasn't very good. but. Deion Sanders, as much as maybe I wasn't copying his theatrics, but as far as play and his coverage, my goodness. So that was just kind of my first number that I was randomly assigned. And I mean, I did wear number eight in baseball certain years. So that was also, you know, hey, those were my way, two favorite numbers. 21 was my number for us with, when Dion was on the team, right? You weren't I was not. I was about five years too late for that. So, God, I but feel yeah, like you've been here forever, right? <laughs> like, it just feels like you're part of the furniture. They're like, yeah, you covered Dion, right? You remember that, right? And like, no. And Dion walks by me now like he doesn't know me, right? Like you, you, you've <laughs> never – he came out to Putty Hill, did four hours with us, but like he sees me now. He's like, well, you know, they'll recognize you. Um, so you've never sat with Dion then? No, I, not when he was wearing 37 for the Ravens. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's Has funny. Has Shannon you, you just ever mentioned... sat down with you and me or no? No, huh. maybe not. I don't think so. He used to come by all the time so. back before he was a big yeah. star. Yeah. No, well, you know, I mean, hey, he's he's across the desk from Skip Bayless now. I mean, that's a big deal, right? <laughs> Apparently. Look, I think a big deal to me. And you Making know, good money. God bless him. I mean, that's great. Vinny Testaverde came home. That's, uh, you know, once I had great. Vinny on the show, uh, you know, I don't need Dion back on or, you know, I don't need anybody to be nice <laughs> to me anymore. I'm all good. But, you know, the, the Raven season part of this, following these guys on Twitter and seeing their all season. And, you know, I can see Harbaugh's angst about. These jagoffs are off running around, doing all this, doing all that. They should be in here getting better at their job. And I can hear John railing about that. Like, if they were here, I could make them a better football player. And this is the time of the year where their Players Association, the agents, they're 
mamas, baby mamas, cousins, you know, Hey, it's summertime. Let's, let's get on a jet ski. You know what I mean? Like, um, this is probably a little bit of a struggle, you know, all the way around. And as they take more football away and look, we all know rules have been broken and this is where you get sideways with John and everybody else. Um, they want more football and the football players want more of this. And what really becomes of this is I want number five. I want number six. <laughs> and John Harbaugh's like, I want you to be able to read the right coverage on third and eight is what I really want you to be able to do. You know? Yeah, no, no question. And, and I mean, we, we can talk a little bit about Marquise Brown taking number five. I don't really have a strong objection to it from the standpoint of you only have so many numbers and counting the off season, you have a 90 man roster and we know no one's getting number 52. You know, no one's getting number 20, you know, 75 is out. Number 19 has been out since Scott Mitchell in 1999 and the great leap of faith that wasn't returned and what DeMarco Farr called him a water Buffalo and all of that. So 19's out. We assume 55 and 73 of Terrell Suggs and Marshall Yonder and Kenton. So you get to a point where you do have to draw the line somewhere and you have to go flat. 90 open. players and 90 numbers. We've been too good. Right, right. Uh, well, that, that's part you of it. You don't have this problem. Cincinnati, <laughs> Cleveland. You know, well, Cleveland has some, some historical yeah. ones, but yeah, you're right. So, these problems. so you, you know, I mean, I, and, and I understand some. I understand that Marquise Brown is no Joe Flacco in terms of January heroics just yet. And hey, you 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 change to that number, which was his college number. You put the you put the target on your back a little bit. But hey, Marquise Brown has actually played well in the postseason the last couple of years. He's one of the few guys that you could point to and say he's consistently performed at a high level. So I know some fans were upset about it. I understand it to a point. You know where I take I have a little more empathy for, for especially talking about the fans is those fans who invested in a number 15 Marquise Brown or a number 48 Patrick Queen, and now those jerseys are no good. I have a little more understanding there, and that's why I've always said to people, wait a couple years, because you never know. Kyle Bowler was number eight his rookie year, switched to seven. Chris McAllister was 28 his first year, switched to 21. So so there's some, some historic precedent, uh, even before getting into this single-digit number craze, uh, as far as pl young players changing their jersey number, but Look, Joe Flacco is going to be in the ring of honor. He's going to have his day when he retires. You know, if, if, he, if he's not running around as the Eagles quarterback, uh, if Jalen Hurts doesn't work out this year, but he's going to get his day. He's fondly remembered, but you do have to draw the line at some point. And if the Ravens have said, first of all, we, they would say we haven't officially retired any numbers, but unofficially the Hall of Fame guys, yeah, we're going to keep those numbers uh, you know, on ice then that's fine with me. I don't have a big problem with that. And we're now two years removed from that. So uh, number five, Marquise Brown, hey, you know, go, go uh, be a star in January like Joe Flacco was once upon a time. And, and everyone will love you for it. And no one will care that you switch numbers. But, uh, but it brings us to OTAs, Ravens uh, starting that off this week. And you just mentioned some of the, some of the conversation, some of the debate about attendance. We, we all remember the Ravens were one of the, teams or, or groups of players from teams that put out NFLPA statements. You know, the sense I've gotten is I, I, I think a lot of that is cooled. Uh, I think you're going to see plenty of players in the building this week. Uh, Wednesday's open to the media and, you know, we'll get a look at uh, how th these guys are looking. I, I expect to see not every guy on the roster because they've never had perfect attendance in that way, but the guys that need to be there, the rookies, the second year guys who are fighting for roster spots, even those veteran players like, I don't know, Anthony Levine, LJ Fort, guys that aren't, you know, aren't assured a starting job. I think you're going to see a lot of those guys there. So, you know, the Patrick sense I've Queen's so excited, he wants to get his new jersey on, right? So there you go. He, back, he's got right? he gets to wear his number six. Right. Absolutely. Gets to work with Rob Ryan, who uh, if rookie camp was any indication, it'll be interesting hearing the banter between Rob Ryan and Wink Martindale, who are, are longtime friends. And of course, uh, the Ryan family connection with what the, the, the uh, night I met Wink them, Martindale. beer was involved in Indiana. Oh, the, so, yeah, I, I that think was that, a, that was a, that was a night there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a safe assumption when they're off the clock. Every uh, time but, I see Wink, I always come with, Hey, Wink Nestor. I, I remember you from Indianapolis. <laughs> Wink. Uh, he's, he's one of a kind, but, <laughs> but, but, but I think there's, you know, there's excitement for getting most of the team together. Uh, I mean, I, I think everyone's curious to see what this passing game is going to look like with Sammy Watkins and Rashad Bateman and Tylen Wallace. And 
uh, Marquise Brown being a year older and Devin DuVernay being a year older. And, you know, do they bring in another tight end at some point? So, you know, edge rusher, there's lots of questions there. I mean, Justin Houston, Melvin Ingram still out there. Do they ultimately bring in someone like Houston or do they say, hey, for the money it's going to require, we're not sure the juice is going to be worth the squeeze. We'd rather give more opportunities to Adafe Owe and Jalen Hayes and, uh, I mean, just go down the list. So, I mean, it it really is, uh, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Look, it's football well, and these shorts. these guys in here getting to moving but, around and sweating a little bit and getting to know them a little bit will give you more – they thought they knew Ray Lewis till the day he came in there. The minute he came in there, they're like, well, you know, this is different. I think they felt that way about a lot of those kind of guys like Ray Rice and different guys that once they got him in the building for a, a week or a month, this time of year, they felt like we're going to be okay with that kid. Or, oh, my God, we drafted, <laughs> yeah. we drafted that kid? We, we, they have definitely have had that going on, too. There was, you know, and we can name the names through all of this. But they feel differently when they see the kid show up at work how he interacts with people in the room, whether he remembers people's names, mm -hmm. if he's in the hot tub, does he look in over his head? Does he look lost? Is he bewildered by it all? I, I think they've all seen all of that. I mean, especially hardball now, 13 years into this, probably takes him about the third day to say, that kid's going to be on development this year, maybe. And, or, hmm, that kid's a leader. I like that guy. You know, that, you know we did well with him. Yeah, there, I, I think you're absolutely right there. And the, the good thing for the Ravens is there's been more of the, you know, the positive observations more so than the, oh, I, I don't know about that. But, you know, I mean, they, they certainly liked what they saw from Od Odafe Owe and Dalen Hayes. I think I said Jalen a couple moments ago, Dalen Hayes. Uh, but, you know, there's still that question of who might they add between now and September or, or, or even just say now and, and the beginning of training camp. Uh, I I think you have to be careful with assessments this time of year. I mean, I think what you said, there is a lot of that going on, but I can also tell you guys that looked incredible, absolutely incredible in May and June. And then you put the pads on and it changes or on the flip side, some guys who don't really look all that impressive. And, and maybe we talk about more guys in, in the trenches here because you don't have live contact, but then come the second week of training camp, it starts coming for that guy and you say, all right, that's the player they wanted to see, or, or it turns on in the preseason games. So, you know, th this is, but this is that fun time of year where you already had rookie camp a couple weekends ago. And, and now you have most of the team. People know, you know where the parking lot is. They know where, oh, yeah, they know where the equipment right. manager, you know, all those kinds of things. That's what happens this time of year. Sure. And, and I mean, the reality is now Rashad Bateman's going to be catching passes from Lamar Jackson over these next few weeks. So doesn't mean he's going to be their number one receiver week one, but you're hoping that he's the guy that is going to maybe not starting, but he's going to, you hope he's going to play a lot. He's the 27th overall pick. You know, I mentioned Owe. you're expecting him to play a lot as a rookie, especially how much they've talked up his ability against the run. You know, as much as Owe has been labeled this boomer bust guy, go back and look at his tape at Penn state and even PFF, you know, they, they grade the college players as well. They said Odafe Owe is one of the best run stoppers from the edge position uh, in college football last year. So even as people were dwelling about, OK, he didn't have any sacks and where's the production there? It elevates the floor if he can set the edge and play the run and do some of those things. So, yeah, you, you want him to be a, a 12 sacks guy eventually and you hope sooner rather than later. But if he can also play on first and second down, which a guy like Terrell Suggs, even when he came into the league, wasn't necessarily that guy. I mean, the Ravens had Peter Bolwer and Adalis Thomas at the time, but Suggs was more of a situational guy, whereas I think they feel like Oway can, you know, if he's not starting, maybe they defer to Pernell McPhee early in the season as the ceremonial starter, but uh, they have ex every expectation that Oway is going to play a lot. So well, this now, is their chance to go see exactly. him and whether they get – Keep that confidence in him or say, sure, because it's going to go one way or the other. And, and I no think question. they have confidence in him, but they're also professionals and they're like, he's a rookie. It is what it is. Let's get him out here and see how quickly he picks up on yeah. things that we want him to do before we go spending money on a 32, before we go trying to find Dwight Freeney or, or you know, call Suggs or whatever. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, and right now it's more so the Justin Houston's and the Melvin Ingram's that are still out there. I mean, Kerrigan wound up in Philadelphia last week, so, you know, he's off the board, but there's still some of those guys. I mean, Olivier Vernon is still out there, you know, as of the start of this week. So, I mean, it's, you know, it really is, I, 
again, you don't want to draw too many conclusions off of guys in shorts and you one way or the other, you don't want to write guys off and you don't want to blow them up and think, Oh, we, we drafted the next Lawrence Taylor. I mean, you dream that that's the scenario, but you know, realistically, the truth is somewhere in between, usually somewhere between Lawrence Taylor and I don't know. Give me an edge rusher who is a total flop. Lawrence plot. Taylor Court. on third and eight and get you off the field with two fifteen left to go against the Steelers, you know, in week 13. There you go. He just needs to be Lawrence Taylor on that play, right? I mean, that's how it works, literally, right? Make yeah. one play at the right time, and you will remember sweating your ass off in a 94-degree midweek OTA on a Wednesday out there, you know, trying to get water and wondering what you're doing out there. You know, that's when those plays have to happen. Yeah, and even if he's not Lawrence Taylor, can he be closer to Peter Bolware? That would be pretty good, right, for a first-round pick late in the first round. Bolware was a top-five pick. I mean – so, hey, I mean, this is the time of year when, again, you start to gain that context. What does it look like? And, and you said it. I, I think a lot of those personal interactions, especially with the pandemic, I mean, these is, there's always, there are always going to be some surprises in that way. And the Ravens, to their credit and maybe to their fortune in, in some instances, they've been pleasantly surprised many more times than really disappointed that, wow, you know, like Earl Thomas, for example, you know, a guy that they, you know, they've kind of sort of admitted they didn't do as much homework on that as they should have from a personal standpoint. The player, you know, hey, Earl Thomas played pretty well in 2019, even if he wasn't Earl Thomas of six years before that. But the personality clearly was a, a major problem. So there's always some unknown. I think the pandemic has complicated that even, you know, you we can sit here and talk with someone for an hour via Zoom and feel like you get to know them. But how do they treat other people? How do they interact with their teammates? How, how do they interact with the equipment staff? How do they interact with the folks working in the cafeteria? Those are, those are things you're not necessarily going to find in a scouting report, but those are things that aren't necessarily going to turn a bad player into a good player or a good player into a Hall of Fame player. But those are traits that I think there's, you know, that can make an impact, uh, especially when times are tough, for example. So, you know, you start to... Not that John Harbaugh is keeping a diary of that, but you start to, you know, you peel back the onion a little bit as far as what these guys are like as people a little bit more. And certainly the, the what's going to be paramount is they have to be able to play. I mean, if, if they're, they could be a really nice guy and they can't play at all, then, you know, or they could be a jerk and they can't play at all. They're going to be gone quickly, but you know, you do kind of find out what kind of personalities you're going to have. And uh, I think for the Ravens, as much as they've talked about their culture and, and I mean, it's been good and positive for a long, long time. I mean, you don't you aren't as successful as they've been for two decades without that. But s specifically in this Lamar Jackson era, uh, as far as how much culture they've talked about and, you know, uh, Lamar famously, uh, they talk about how he knows everyone's name in the building and, and all of that. You know, you're hoping you've added some more guys in that regard and, and in addition to good football players, but you start to get a better idea of how that looks and you, know, you get an idea at this point in time, as much as there's been some controversy as far as guys being in the building or not, we saw what happened with Jawan James and the Broncos and, you know, guys working out away from the facility and all these players, uh, you know, from various teams putting out statements. I, I think the dust has settled. It sounds like there's been some dialogue between players and coaches uh, you know, I, I think the Ravens have, you know, for quite a few years, and I think this is a tribute to the kind of attendance they've gotten over the years. I think they take care of their guys, you know, when they're in the building in the spring. And I, I don't think they're necessarily running them ragged. They've broken the rules on occasion, as you mentioned a few minutes ago. But in terms of you know, wanting to get guys to work, but also not trying to make it like it's May training camp, two a days or, you know, <laughs> Bear Bryant with uh, the junk. To some degree, boys these, way are back young, when. these are young men who like football a lot. It's the middle of their lives. Yeah. Coming together and getting to know each other should be fun the way you and I covering sports was fun, right? Like, like they, they're, yeah. but for the most part, they're not thinking, oh, I've got to get off the jet ski. Really? They're thinking, oh, I get to come up and hang out and be an NFL player and hang out in the building and, you know, do all of that. That's, this is part and parcel of what they do until they're 30. And then they don't want to do this anymore. And I've seen well, that and that's over the 30 big, years. Or, or that's the big thing where they still want to do it, but. Ed Reed is basically saying, I'll see you in late July well, or Todd, in Ed's case, a couple of kids by yeah. that point and a wife in, in Arizona, you know, they, they, it's a different, 
It's a right. different thing when you're a grown up than when you're a kid coming out of college. And I don't want to say this is more important to you, but I would say in the middle of May, the camaraderie part that you pointed out, getting to know each other, but just the part that it feels more like college. It feels more like, hey, we got football. We got spring games. We got, you know, it's football. It's football. It's what we do. Um, and John plays big into that from his yeah. college background. You know, John's good at making this a college program in May. Really? Yeah. And, and I think to his credit, as much as, you know, as much as John has a reputation that he can be rough at times, you know, rough around the edges and how he, you know, media, whatever it is, I, I think he's for a long, long time. And maybe it was a little bit different at the very beginning, as I think it probably is for most coaches until they really find themselves, so to speak, and, and adjust at least the ones who last, you know, they evolve, right? They evolve or they get fired four or five, six years into it. And that's even on the longer side for many coaches. But I think he's, I, I think he's come to grips probably with not being as phased if, I don't know, Clay Campbell isn't there this week or Derek Wolf isn't there. And I'm, I'm just throwing their names out there. I'm not speculating on who's there and who isn't, but guys who've been in the league a long time, guys who know what it takes to be ready come mandatory mini camp week and come July and most importantly, September and October when you're playing games that actually matter. It's different though, for those younger guys who are one, not established whatsoever in terms of, in many cases, having a job, having a roster spot. You know, if you're talking about late round picks and second or third year draft picks who haven't really, you know, Ben powers, guys like that, you know, who have played a little bit here and there, but, no, I wouldn't say he's a complete 100% lock to make the roster, depending on how things go. So you have those guys that are trying to develop, trying to establish themselves. You have some of the d veteran depth players who are at a point where they're holding on at this point. You know, they don't want a young guy to take their roster spot. And then the rookies, I mean, they're, they're trying to find the cafeteria. They're trying to find a meeting room. They're trying to see how this all works, uh, which they had a little taste of it with rookie camp, but now we get into OTAs and they get to rub elbows with the veterans and start learning from them. So, but I, but I think Harbaugh has cultivated, you know, an atmosphere where for the most part guys are, are, are going to be in the building and I would expect, you know, they're not going to have all 90 guys out there, but I'm guessing you'll see at least 60, 70, you know, I probably a little more than that based off of history. Uh, and again, some of those NFL PA stances, I understand why the players want to take that stance, and I, I even support that. At the same time, the reality is this isn't the NFL in 1970 anymore where guys come to training camp and they're getting in shape at that point because they've had off-season jobs and, and, and haven't been worked out working out. These guys work out year-round as it is, so I think many agents and people that really understand how the off-season works – I think they're privately telling guys that need to be there, you know, whether you're talking about fringe roster guys, bubble guys, young players, whoever, they're probably probably privately telling their clients, you're working out either way. Go to the building. You don't have to be there every day, but get a, get be there most cake. of the Show time. Get a crab cake. Yeah, be there most of the time. Yeah. You know, if there's a week that you had a family thing that you planned, fine, but be there most of the time by that small chance that if you're training and, and working out elsewhere, and it's not even that some guy's doing something reckless, you know, being on a motorcycle or anything, but you pop your Achilles working out or you tear your ACL working out away from the facility. You don't want to give that team an excuse to basically say, well, that guy hasn't been here all, all spring. And he was on the, the roster bubble as it was. And he didn't have a very good season last year. Oh, well, we're, we're going to go after his salary then. If you're there more frequently, you know, it's kind of an understood thing. And the way that the Ravens didn't go after Terrell Suggs money, even though, what, he tore his Achilles playing basketball, or he said a conditioning test, but eyewitnesses that it was a basketball game in Arizona. But, you know, if you remember Steve Bishotti said at the time, you know, I, I like the fact that Terrell was working out and not just on his couch and, and all of that. So, but the point is these guys, and, and Terrell Suggs at that point was, what, that was his 10th year in the league, you know, so he's an established guy. These younger guys, there really is a lot of value for them to be there. But I'd say on the flip side, if you're John Harbaugh and the coaching staff and the organization, you know, incentivize that, that, that it makes sense for these guys to come in, that they're not going to be run into the ground, but it's going to be smart, efficient work, you know, some camaraderie, a little bit of football work, but it's not going to be a case where 
they're you know they're running so they're dog ass tired and just you know that, that, that you're in a position where you're these guys are thinking twice about being there and i think the ravens have found a good balance of, of that over the years ice cream will be served at some point or snowballs or exactly something like yeah there that. you go there you go Luke Jones can be found. Baltimore Luke anywhere the internet serves you, whether it's Instagram, uh, the LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, wherever we are. He'll be back at the ballpark whenever there's a ballpark to be at. Uh, And in the meantime, we're monitoring all things sports around here and local things and crab cakes. We uh, began our tour at Fadley's. We were at State Fair last week in Catonsville, headed over to Costas uh, and around the corner from Pizza John's and Coco's and a whole bunch of other places we're going. We'll be telling you more about all of that at WNST and BaltimorePositive.com.